What's up? I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour and we are hanging out in the backyard in beautiful autumn and if you look close you can see the fish that the people who made this pond and lived here before me left for me. I think it's just awesome and I think it's an ideal setting to talk about storytelling. And that's what I want to do in this video is consider the way that stories have a knack for coming in the side door and getting through to the level of the heart and the emotions and getting through the armor in a way that just saying words at people can't do. And my favoriteest story of all time in terms of fiction is the Lord of the Rings stuff. It's J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth world. I want to introduce you to a guy named Dr. Steve Fratt. He's a longtime professor at Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. He's a history guy. He was my undergraduate advisor and somebody I've learned a ton from. He is a, a token scholar. I, I think that's a fair statement. He's worked through the actual manuscripts. He's looked at Tolkien's notes. He knows stuff that he's read in the margins about what Tolkien was thinking when he wrote these stories. And so I asked him if we could take a minute and sit down and talk about the Christian themes, the spiritual themes in The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, The Silmarillion, all of the stuff that Tolkien wrote. And so we're going to Deerfield, Illinois to do that. You will see that behind him, he's got a whole table game set up for his college students that he had all built out for them to do a military simulation of one of the battles in Tolkien's story. You'll also see that he's wearing a Civil War era cap. He's a historical reenactor. I mean, this guy really takes the history thing seriously, the story thing seriously. Right now, I want to introduce you to Dr. Steve Fratt, where we're going to sit and consider the question of the spiritual themes, the Christian themes in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings universe. All right, let's get after it. What do you see as being the key theological themes in Tolkien's writing? Yeah, there, uh, there are many. And I'm going to have to say that as I read the Silmarillion and teach it, that's the key to understanding what the themes truly are in Lord of the Rings. Okay. At the start of the Silmarillion, you have the creation of the world, the music of the Ainur, and the powers, or what we might call angels, are singing. There's no physical stuff going on. They're spirits, they're singing, they're singing in harmony, and everything's this is like just fine. the platonic notion of the new Yeah, there the you go. Yeah. Getting formed <laughs> yeah. to exactly. ideals. And, and then Melkor. Melkor is the greatest of all the Ainur, greatest of all the angels. He has a bit of each of their gifts, and he is anxious about the void. There's a void out there with nothing in it. Oh, come on, we gotta do something with the void. Uh, Aluvatar. I say Iluvatar, some say Iluvatar, I think it's Iluvatar. God, okay. God in this case is mindful of the void. He has his plan in his own time that Melkor is anxious. He wants to do something. And so what he does, he comes back and he starts to sing a brash kind of sound that doesn't connect with the others. If with, I'm so. tracking with you. Yeah. In the creation narrative in yes. Tolkien's universe, things are literally sung into existence and you have this this musical battle of wills between the character representative yep. of the god of abraham and yep. isaac and the character that you say is representative of satan and what happens then Iluvatar says melkor you don't get it you could do whatever you want but you're going to someday realize you cannot do anything apart from me it's always dependent upon me and regardless of all attempts for you to mar and mess, it will all come around to my will in the end. Now that right there seems like maybe the most significant Christian theme that runs through the Silmarillion, perhaps the Hobbit as well as it connects with the larger picture and all through the Lord of Rings. The basic of the Silmarillion is Feanor is, a, is a, a, the, the most creative of all the elves. He creates the Silmarils, which are the light of the trees, the only light on the earth or in these trees, the rest is starlight. And Melkor kills the, uh, the trees, steals the Silmarils, and that creates this long sin of the elves. Feanor's sons vow that if they don't recover these Silmarils, these jewels, 
the Melkor now, three of them in his crown in Middle Earth, he's escaped to Middle Earth, they will all be thrown into the utter darkness. And so what happens is the whole Silmarillion, it's this long tale and all the stories are about continuously the sons of Feanor trying to live up to their oath of trying to get the Silmarils. The major theme there is we make things, they're amazing. A Feanor could only do it once, but then he becomes so obsessed with the thing that he has made. And so this is kind of the sin of the elves. It's about their downfall. And eventually what happens is that the powers, the angels, after five huge battles against Melkor, they got to come into Beleriand and because of their presence, it all sinks into the sea. Whenever God's angels have to duke it out with the Satan figure on earth, part of the earth gets destroyed. And so they're going to be long suffering and let things go for a long time before the end comes. And so I make an applicability there. Tolkien's much more into history and applicability. So for me personally, it helps me get a sense of God's long suffering with all of humanity. Uh, Christ came, died on the cross, covered our sins. He's tearing his return for whatever purposes we don't know. But meanwhile, those of us who are here, maybe at times I take encouragement like the elves, we're fighting the long defeat, okay? Uh, Christ has already won, but it looks like maybe that's not the case. Sometimes we lose heart. I'm hearing a, a creation narrative. Yes. I'm hearing something that, that sounds a little bit like the fall, but, but it's a complex fall because yeah. the elves don't just fall because some bad person does something to them. They fall because of external influence as well as their own corruptibility and pride over what they've made. The external prompts their test of character and whatever they are is revealed. And then you come to Lord of the Rings, the ring has the same effect, except the hobbits seem to be, since they are the meek who will inherit the earth, they're not power seekers, so the reign of power does not elicit the same kind. But it can wear them down. Look, Gollum, he was a hobbit. He had it for hundreds of years, it wore him down. Bilbo resists for a hundred years, but even he's my precious, my precious. Frodo, now Frodo brings it to Mordor and it ramps up influence over him and power. So I, I think, uh, in fact, there's this uh, scene where he and uh, Galadriel are in Lothlorien and Bilbo says, or Frodo says, oh, I'll give you the ring. And there's a lot more behind what Galadriel does because Galadriel left Amon to come to Middle-earth desiring to rule. That's 6,000 years before she met Frodo. In fact, because she left Amon, she was not going to be allowed to come back, okay? And after Valerian falls into the sea and the Silmarillion's over, there was a moment where, okay, we'll forgive you, but she decided, I'm going to stay in Middle-earth, I want to rule. So she wasn't going to be allowed to come back to, to leave with the ship in the, gray, in the gray Havens and go. So here she is, and she is confronted with this weaponized power ring that would allow her to rule. So that's 6,000 years of desire. And so what's amazing and tremendous is that her character is tested and it reigns true. She will remain Galadriel. And we don't know if she's going into the West at that moment, but she'll remain Galadriel. And because all that she went through after the ring was destroyed, the power said, you know what? You get a pass, you're coming. In fact, she gave her pass away to Frodo and uh, she ends up getting it. That's the stuff you find when you read some of the other things going on. But you, can you see how the Silmarillion with its issues of human sin and temptation and our tendency to cave into it for all good intentions, we think we could do a better job and then we succumb and we get uh, possessive. We want to create something, we want to be possessive. And then that does us in in the end. And that's a theme that carries over in Lord of the Rings. And so Galadriel, I don't know, this time through, now that I've studied her more, uh, she's even more impressive than I thought of before. Tolkien at times did not know where he was going. And he had writer's block, 
and he put it aside for a year or two, trying to find his way, meaningful, how's this thing going to end? He kind of got himself in. So it's not like J.K. Rowling, who kind of mapped things out and knew where she was going, and then took her time to do it, and, and that's a great story for other reasons. Tolkien did this part-time in the evenings after his main gig, in the wee hours of the morning for 12 years, part of the years during World War II. And what you come up with is something, uh, you come up with a testament, I think, a testimony of hope beyond hope, despair, but these people lived day by day, step by step, true to their character and what they were already inside. They made decisions, key decisions, that they were going to be, remain true. Uh, some didn't, but those that remained true day by day got through it all. And in the end, in the end, you could even say, without too much support, even Frodo, in, in the end, needed some help at the end from unexpected quarters. Yeah. So their characters that you think, oh, they ought to be gone, and, uh, you know, Gollum had a role to play. Even Gandalf points this out in the movies, if you've yeah. seen the movies. Yeah. He had a role to play. And so that's another thing, it's the theme of um, um, uh, re restraining yourself from hubris, thinking that you know what's going to happen the next, down the next road. And so what I see in that is, in a sense, a kind of a model for how, surely, if uh, people in this novel who are Christians remain true, uh, here's a model for how Christians who want to remain true and be mature, they need to understand that life is going to be a little bit longer of a struggle than they think. It's not simple solutions or simple answers to, to the problems around us. It might mean, like Job, you have to go through these things. So the characters that stand out, of course, are the hobbits and Sam. Maybe Sam takes the show. You know, I'm not a hobbit. Frankly, I have to admit, I relate more to the Rohan folks. I'm too big to be a hobbit. So I, I'm not. So I really relate to the Hobbit. <laughs> and I have enormously is, hairy feet. And when I watched the movies yes. and read the books, I wanted to relate to the guy with cool hair. I mean, who wants to be Legolas? He's awesome. Oh, yeah. He's tall, he's athletic, yeah, he's, he's perfect. cool, he's perfect. <laughs> the elves are perfect. But almost. I aged a little bit. Yeah. And, and, I came, and I came to admire the Hobbits. Yes. Because if I could pick one thing that I would want to be, yeah. it's what you just said true and not as given to corruption but I admire them because I'm not them. And I, I want what they have. Yes. When in, in reality, I'm more of one of the flawed characters, maybe the Boromir who would weaponize power, even try to weaponize to take, people for my own purpose. Because you see it as an augmentation of who you are. I'm strong, all I need is a little augmentation and I'll Just get it done. Limits. Just a little extra. Whereas the hobbits, they know they're nothing. You know, yeah. Mary, and they end up being heroic. Mary helps ALM by taking out the witch queen. Yes. You know, I have to admit, yes, Sam, what he went through trying to haul Frodo single-handedly through Mordor. But when the, uh, Sam and Frodo get beyond Carathungal, and they're going down that road into the valley, and they stop, and Frodo just can't go any further, Sam's there, and all of a sudden he notices that the sky in darkness is lightening a little bit, and far off away, he hears a scream. The scream he hears is the Witch King being killed by Eowyn. And so you could say that Eowyn's deed even encouraged the pair on their way, encouraged Sam to continue on. Of all the humans, she had the greatest deed to stand up to the Witch King. But so I relate most to her um, and what she went through, being caught in a cage, being restricted, trying to prove oneself. For her, it was proving uh, a meaningful death in battle. And the demons that I've gone through on occasion has been, is what I'm doing here as a teacher at a very small Christian college, is, is that a meaningful life? And I think your presence here today has helped me take encouragement that, yeah, it has been a meaningful life because I've had some impact on you, my younger brother. And so this is the sort of thing we kind of wonder to what extent 
have we lived meaningful lives? That's her greatest concern. And she ends up finding that she has beyond expectation. One of the things he said, I don't know all the letters he wrote, I haven't read them all, but I do know he said that he had hoped that what War of the Rings would do in his writings would cause people to want to create, would want to, you know, within this world, create something. And as a Catholic, I think Tolkien understood what it meant to have the image of God in us at the creation. Even despite the fall, we still are stamped with the image of God. And in that sense, we're creative beings and we're co-creators. Two grown men sitting there in the middle of a student center with people passing by and the power of story manifests in such a way that it gets through the armor of both of us emotionally and we don't even care. Because story is unique in the way it works, in the way that it connects with us. And in this case, it's unique in the way that it articulates these transcendent themes of the Christian faith of, of planet Earth as designed by God through these characters that are created out of thin air by somebody who put all this time and energy into this. And I loved what Dr. Fratt said there at the end about how Tolkien hoped that his storytelling, that his creating would, would be an imitation of the creative impulse of God and that it would prompt other people to want to imitate that creative impulse of God and to do the same kind of thing. I love that the conversation ended on that note about the creative impulse and what it is to imitate that. And I have a friend who just made a children's book about exactly that kind of stuff and exactly the kind of hurdles that you and I and everybody feels when we step out and try to do stuff that involves art or story. The lady who made this is my friend, Bethany. She is a magnificent artist. Here, let me just show you things that she made. And what this story is about is a beaver who learns all the things that a beaver is supposed to do and work on and that a beaver is supposed to be. But along the way, this character wants to follow that creative impulse and do that creative stuff and is afraid and it's difficult. But the beauty of the story is the character changes and overcomes that and does the things and makes the things and creates the stuff that she wants to create in a way that is beautiful and redemptive, much like the book is beautiful and redemptive and presented in that way. If you wanna go deeper into this world of creating and encouraging kids who are in your life to create and, and take that leap as well, there might be some young Tolkien's out there who would be very inspired to read Bethany Gano's Lulu the Beaver. If you wanna get a copy of Lulu the Beaver, and I hope you will, you can go to lulubeaver.com and you'll be able to get your mitts on that and share it with an aspiring creative type in your world. Thanks for thinking about story with me. Thanks to Dr. Fratt for taking us all the way down the rabbit hole. And thanks for sharing what were a couple of really meaningful moments for me that he and I got to enjoy together as we talked about a story that has affected both of us in a whole lot of really meaningful ways. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.